started? It started or stopped? It's starting. Okay. Anyway, so good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon to colleagues here in India and probably good morning to colleagues in Africa. And it's our honor and privilege to welcome high level delegation from Zhejiang Academy of Agricultural Sciences. So I would like to just mention once again the names of this high level delegation. Professor Hong Wu Lao, who is the president of Shandong, uh, Zhejiang Academy of Agricultural Sciences. Dr. J. Dei, and he is the office director of Zhejiang Academy of Agriculture Sciences. Dr. Guo Jing Li, director for the Institute of Vegetable Sciences. And also Dr. Zhang Jun Wang, who is the deputy director for the Institute of Crops and Nuclear Technology. And Dr. Yong Wen Chi, he is the, from the Institute of Crops and Nuclear Technology Utilization. And of course, we have our today's speaker with us, Professor P. Shu, and he is representing Institute of Vegetables from Zhejiang Academy. So we would like to welcome you once again. So please join me in welcoming all these colleagues from Zhejiang Academy. And uh, now we are coming for the seminar. So I know Pishu for several years because he has been working on cowpea. I have been working on chickpea and other legume crops. So we are following each other through literature, meetings and different programs. And I had a privilege to meet or to visit Academy last year as a reciprocation. So we are having the visit of the Academy here at ICRISAT and they are visiting several colleagues in ICRISAT and also the World Vegetable Center. So they, I hope they will be having a great meeting. So now let me give brief introduction of Professor P. Shu. He is a professor and cowpea or bottle guard breeder at Zhejiang Academy of Agricultural Sciences in Hangzhou. He received his PhD degree from Nanjing Agriculture University, Nanjing and Hangzhou, both of them, they are very beautiful places. I have been there. So I would like to encourage other Indian colleagues, they should visit sometimes. And he also worked as a visiting scientist at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and also UC Riverside. He is also executive council member of Young Section of the Chinese Society for Horticultural Sciences and a member of Chinese Society for Molecular Horticultural Breeding. He is also academic editor for an international journal called Legume Research, which is published from India since 2013. Professor Shu was also elected to the prestigious national program for the support of top-notch young professionals in 2015. In terms of his research, his expertise in genetics and genomics and also trait mapping and using these research in marker-assisted selection and marker-assisted recurrent selection. He is using both traditional breeding approaches as well as molecular breeding approaches including microarray, genotyping by sequencing, target genome sequencing to gain the knowledge to accelerate plant breeding. So this is similar area which many of genomics of molecular breeding people are doing here at Crisat. And his main research projects include genome and pen genome of cowpea, genetic determinants of pod length in cowpea and fruit shape in the bottle guard, population genomic signatures and domestication history of vegetable cowpea. I should also mention that Professor P. Shu has been a prolific author, published high quality papers in several journals including Plant Biotech Journal, Plant Journal and Molecular Breeding, many other journals. He is a rich person also whenever he publishes any good paper, he gets more money from academy and so we need to, be, we need to join efforts with PSU so that we can also get some money from your academy after publishing the paper, right? <laughs> and later you can translate this thing to president as well. <laughs> so with these words, I would like to welcome or invite Professor Pishu for this seminar. He will talk about the Vegetable Institute, Academy, the Vegetable Institute and the study on cowpea orphan genes. If you want to use this one, this is fine. If you want to use microphone, water, this is okay. And then, this, okay, so we will use that one. And so that you see it works. Yeah. One. And the pointer is in the center. Okay. Okay. 
Let me see. So it's okay. Fine. Okay. Good. So, so many thanks, Rajiv, my uh, legging research colleague and my uh, very close personal friend. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, it's my great honor and the privilege and my pleasure to stand here to uh, present about my academy, my institute, and my studies on the cowpea orphan genes. So as Rajiv just said, we are from the beautiful Hangzhou city, and I do welcome and invite all of you to uh, consider visit our city. So in the first part of my talk, I'm going to give you a uh, brief introduction of the Zhejiang Academy of Agricultural Sciences, the Institute of Vegetables, and our team, which is the, uh, is the cowpea and the bottle good research team. So first of all, I want to give you a geological information about this. This is located to the southeast of China in the Zhejiang province. The city is Hangzhou city, which is very close to Shanghai. By a bullet train, it is only one hour distance, but it is quite distant to Beijing, the capital of China. So Hangzhou is the capital city of Zhejiang province. The current population is around 6 million. Hangzhou is famous for tourism and business. I believe some of you have known of the very famous West, oh, sorry, the West Lake of Hangzhou. It's a city lake, very beautiful, with uh, green mountains around the lake. And here is a magnificent Chantang River famous for the tide. Hangzhou is also a quite developed economic center of the Zhejiang province. I believe many of them know about Alibaba. It is one of the biggest enterprises in China. And you know, anyone knows who, where the headquarters of Alibaba is? It's right in Hangzhou. So when you have opportunity to visit Hangzhou, you have to go and visit Alibaba. We now have an overview of this. This has a long history, which dates back 1908. So its age is 110. This is currently a comprehensive non-profit agricultural research institution, and it is also the biggest single institute in Zhejiang province. Researchers perform basic and applied research covering all agricultural research areas, except for tea and the fishery. But we are planning on uh, establishing the tea and the fishery research discipline also. This picture shows the owner of this. In uh, 1958, the former chairman Mao visited this. It is a high honor to our Academy. And one year earlier, the Premier Zhou visited this also. We currently have a faculty number of 1031, with 895 are research personnel. More than 400 are senior professionals, and 668 hold a PhD degree. We have 16 institutes of ZES, such as the Institute of Crops and, in, and the Utilization of Radiation, the Institute of Vegetables, the Institute of Horticulture, and so on. John here is our old building for the Institute of Vegetables. So this picture was taken last year. So that building was the one where Reggie visited. Not so good, but look at our new building. It's much, much more better. Much, much better, sorry. It's, it's very spacious and fully equipped. The Institute of Vegetables dates back to 1960. At that time, it was small, just like a vegetable research laboratory. 
But in 2001, the former Institute of Horticulture, particularly the branch of the facility called Vision Laboratory and the Vegetable Breeding Laboratory, as well as the formal introduction and the development center of new varieties of zest, they were combined to form the new Institute of Vegetables. So now we have 61 staffs with 13 being professors, 33 are PhD researchers, and the one, actually me, was elected to the national program for the support of top-notch young professionals. The breakdown of the departments of our institute is like this. We have an administration office, 12 research groups. We are part of the state key lab of food safety research. And we have a national consortium for broccoli improvement. The Zhejiang Provincial Key Engineering Center for Protected Horticulture also is located in our institute. We're also running a seed company, which makes for profits for us. And there are two formal international cooperation centers between our institute and our foreign partners. Sorry. So in terms of vegetable breeding research, we have 12, uh, sorry. In terms of uh, vegetable breeding research, we have several research groups, each focuses on one to two vegetable crops. And they are kind of linked, such as the tomato and the pepper. But some groups work on crops that are not so related, such as our group. We work with cowpea and the bottle group. We have a cauliflower and broccoli research group, vegetable solving group, melon watermelon groups, and so on. The research areas covers germplasm collection, identification, and utilization, genetics and genomics of these important vegetable crops, the genes controlling key traits, new breeding techniques. Breeding is our important task. We are always working on breeding of new varieties. Also important is high efficient cultivation techniques. High efficient cultivation techniques, which is important for uh, releasing new varieties. Breeding techniques that are currently used in our institute include molecular marker based selection. In our uh, broccoli research group, microspore culture is widely used for uh, rapid generation of breeding lines. In our uh, cabbage and the pepper research group, the transfer and the utilization of male sterility is also important. Some groups are working on gene modification using the technology of gene editing. Somatic cell fusion it was, trans, uh, was historically used in our group, but now it's, it becomes less important. Which is becoming more important is the precise phenotyping techniques. Breeding targets in our institute is quite related to the economical and the social development level in Zhejiang. Because as I said in the beginning, Zhejiang is a quite developed region in China. So people are more focused on quality instead of yield of vegetables. So ranks the first in our breeding target is, oh sorry, is better quality, including flavor, appearance of vegetable crops. Due to the increasing concern about environments and the food safety, the multiple disease resistance is mandatory for releasing of new varieties. For long distance transportation, better storage capacity is also highlighted in our breeding programs. Also important, in more recent years, high content of functional ingredients are considered as an important 
breeding targets because people want to eat more functional ingredients to enhance their health conditions. As always important, abiotic stress resistance and high yield is also um, indispensable factors in our considerations. Shown here are some uh, selected release of varieties during the past decades. This is a pink tomato, slender, straight shaped bottle group, cucumber, melon, eggplant, vegetable soybean, Chinese cabbage, and uh, cauliflower. So most of these varieties have been uh, distributed widely in China, and they take up a considerable portion of the seed industry. Shown here are some more recent varieties. So what's the differences between these new varieties and these previous ones? I would say these new varieties, they are better in quality traits. For example, this bottle group new variety is more tasty and richer in uh, amino acid, free amino acid content. So this uh, broccoli varieties are more rich in uh, antioxidant uh, ingredients. So now look at basic research. As we all know, genomics and the genetics studies are, fun are fun fundamental to a successful and efficient uh, genetic improvement. So we have performed genomic genetic studies on various crops. Shown here is our uh, previous study on population genomics of the bottle group. Shown here is a population genomic study toward revealing the domestication history of cowpea. There are some also uh, researchers working on physiological and molecular aspects. Here is our recent review article published by a tomato research group on evolution and the sucrose, uh, sucrose metab metabolism. In terms of breeding technology, our broccoli research group have developed a quite successful mature microspore cultural system to efficiently generate DH lines. Our protected horticultural research team are really good at the research of hydroponics and matrix culture, greenhouse environmental control, industrial seedling for better and the more uniform seedlings for farmers to grow, vertical agriculture, and special vegetables cultivation. So our new laboratory uh, fully function with the sections of a molecular lab, tissue culture lab, phytone fluorescent microscopy, and some uh, advanced equipment. Uh, I, I would like to uh, mention that for like a more expensive and more advanced equipment, we have a system in our academy, which is that we have a central lab in the academy, which holds and manages all of those bigger machines, like the DNA sequencer, like the LGC, like a qubit line, so those more expensive equipment, so they are all shared academy-wide. So all of the researchers around the academy can use them. We have an ex uh, experimental station around 30 kilometers away from our academy. There are tunnel houses, glass houses, open fields in the station. So the station is not only functional, but also beautiful. During the past decade, the total research funding annually in our institute is around 15 to 20 million yuan per year. And around 40% of the funding are from the national level, which means from the central government. 
and the total income from R and D achievements transfer, which means like a new world, a patent, a patent selling or C C selling, it's like a, around one. Uh, it's like ten million yuan annually. We have active international corporations with foreign organizations. The oldest one is the China-Korean Collaboration Center on Protected Horticulture. The partner is the National Horticultural Research Institute of Korea. The main joint research interests are breeding for rootstocks resistance, resistance to soil bone disease and automatic grafting technique for vegetables. We have long-term and a successful collaboration on cowpea research with the University of California, Riverside in the US. We focus on genetics and the genomics of cowpea molecular breeding for climate resilient cowpea varieties. So our partners include Phil Roberts, Tim Gross, and we uh, jointly published the uh, cowpea draft genome last year. We also have collaborations on drought resistance with the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. So this collaboration focuses more on phenomics-based selection of drought tolerance. I know you have very advanced, very nice phenomics facilities here also, but our system is different. It's like a, a more related to a physiology. So using this system, we can uh, tackle issues like uh, scientific issues like molecular mechanisms control whole plant water relations. And uh, so we are here because we are looking forward to establishing official collaboration with ECRISET. Last year, Reggie visited our academy and uh, President Hong Wu Lao and uh, the enemy, Mr. Dai, Hi. Professor Lee, and uh, some other officials. We had a very nice dinner in a, in a restaurant just by the beautiful West Lake. So I like this picture very much. <laughs> so um, regarding potential research fields for us to uh, collaborate, I think this is not the right place to discuss, but just uh, like a few outlines I figure out. This could include the genomics of legume and other grain crops, molecular breeding series and applications because because I see how advanced you are in terms of using these molecular breeding tools. And also phenomics, particularly on a drought, drought research, right? Now let's move to the introduction of our research team, which is the cowpea and the bottle good research team. We have currently two professors. Professor Guo Jing Li, just sitting there, is also the director of the Institute of Vegetable. He is also the principal investigator of the Vegetable Breeding Consortium in our province. It is a large network focusing on breeding of all kinds of vegetables. He's also the principal investigator of the National Consortium for Broccoli Improvement. So this consortium is funded by the Ministry of Agriculture of China. Professor Li is currently a member of the Chinese Society of Horticulture. Another professor is me, myself. <laughs> so Reju, Reju already introduced me, but, but I, I want to uh, uh, refer to it again because the slide is here. So I'm currently an executive council member of the Young Section for the Chinese Society of Horticulture, and uh, I got funded from the central government under the program called the National Program for the Support of Top-Notch Young Professionals in uh, 2015. In that year, only two people uh, from the research of research field, fields of 
vegetable was elected, so it's quite difficult. And I'm, I have been serving as the editor of the Indian-based International Journal Legume Research for years. We have three senior breeders who are Ms. Xiaohua Wu, Mr. Bao Gen Wang, and Mr. Zhong Fu Lu. Xiaohua and Bao Gen, they are working with traditional breeding mainly, and uh, Mr. Lu is good at the seed technology and also seed selling. We have two young PhD researchers who are Dr. Ying Wang and Dr. Xin Yi Wu. They work more on genetics and molecular breeding. We have also four technicians currently and three graduate students and visitors. Last year, we won the very Chinese pioneer walk around of this. Here, here are two famous cultivars we released. This is a cowpea long bean cultivar, uh, which is famous in uh, southern China, actually nationwide. And this is the Zhepu number six, which is really beautiful in, in terms of appearance and good in flavor. This cultivar, in terms of seed selling, it ranks number one in the bottle good industry for years. All right. So move to the second part, the seminar, entitled Orphan Genes are involved in drought adaptations and eco-climatic eco oriented selections in domestic cowpea. So let me start with the theory of evolution. The Darwin's theory of evolution considers that all life is related and has descended from a common ancestor. So according to this theory, the diversity of life is a product of modifications of populations by natural selection, which means in ancestor DNAs, mutations occur randomly and through selection, artificially or naturally, the mutations were maintained and stacked to form new species. So with this theory, it would be no wonder that a frog can be oh, sorry, a frog can become a prince because they are inherently related, right? So now coming back to the topic, often genes. What are often genes? So let's look at this picture. As we can see, between these four species, there are many genes that are conserved. However, there are also many genes that are unique to a single species. So often genes here, also named as lineage-specific genes, refers to genes that are restricted to a single species or a particular taxonomic group. As compared with conserved genes, much, much less we have known about them. The, a few facts we have already known include that often genes constitute 1% to around one third of the total genome, of the total gene number in a single genome. But from an ecological perspective, the total number of often genes is far more than the total number of conserved genes or non-often genes. So in this sense, it is the orphan genes instead of, instead of the conserved genes that makes the diversity of the living world, right? Also, some publications have shown that orphan genes can be essential in morphological speciation or environmental adaptations. And these essential functions can remain even when these genes are, re are introduced to other species, sometimes even when they are far related. So shown here is an example of an animal species. Transfer of the orphan gene into this animal species makes the species behave, exhibit a unique trait that previously was not exist, existing in this species. So what we don't yet know, that's too much. 
For example, the origin and the turnover of the orphan genes, we don't know. The functions of the majority of the orphan genes, we don't know yet. At the subspecies level, what the signatures of orphan genes, we don't know. Currently, our knowledge for orphan genes are mostly from comparative genomics. So at the species or even the subspecies level, it's like, a, you know, very, very little we have known. What is interesting, we find the DNA sequences of orphan genes appear suddenly, and sometimes they are fully functional, even without any trace of evolutionary ancestry. Some publications show that one orphan gene may carry a triple function, which is regulatory DNA, regulatory RNA, and the protein, like three in one. So it's really, you know, confusion, confusing and uh, really striking that the finding of the orphan genes have actually challenged our current knowledge on molecular biological paradigms and the series of evolution. However, this issue is not the main topic of my talk today. And I'm going to talk about orphan genes as in a case study of cowpea. Now, let's give you some basic information about cowpea. I believe many of them are familiar with cowpea because I know this crop is also important in India. And many of, many of you might be uh, lagging researchers. So just a brief introduction. Cowpea is a member of the legume family. It is native to Africa and currently cultivated all over the world. Cowpea is deployed with a relatively small genome of only 630 megabits. There are two main cultivation groups in the world. One is the cowpea long bean, which is domesticated in the humid Southeast Asia. So this subspecies is mainly consumed as a vegetable with the immature fresh pot cooked or a fry, stir fried. Another cultivation group important is the grain cowpea or common cowpea or African cowpea. So this sub subspecies was domesticated in a dry West Africa. So it's very interesting. These two subspecies, they were domesticated from very different eco-climates, so which will serve as the, the basis of our following research. Cowpea is also characteristic to its adaptation to environmental stresses, particularly hot and the hot weather in a dry condition. Previous physiological studies have shown that cowpea has excellent drought tolerance abilities, even better than the well-known sorghum and the permalate. So an interesting question would be, are cowpea orphan genes related to its characteristic drought tolerance? If we consider about the previous publications about the uh, relationship between species-specific genes and the species-specific morphological traits or adaptive traits. So this becomes the motivation of our study. As the first step, we identified expressed orphan genes from cowpea. So as we all know, identification of orphan genes typically is through genome comparisons. But here we used a different strategy. We started with EST-derived unigenes. There are two reasons why we selected this approach. The first one is because at the time when we performed this analysis, the genome of cowpea was still unavailable. And the second reason is starting with EST-derived unigenes has the advantage to avoid the risk of <coughs> pseudogene contaminations or uh, uh, unexpressed genes because the, those ESTs are from real biological entities. So we compared the EST-derived unit genes with the available legume genomes and also the genome of the model monocot rice and the model 
they called Arabidopsis. After blast search against these genomes, 598 unigenes were found to have no match to any of the genomes. Then, in addition to this in cynical analysis, we also performed a microarray based DNA comparative hybridization with the DNA of cowpea and azuki bean, which is a very close relative to cowpea. So this technology can be considered as an analog of the traditional southern hybridization. We all know southern hybridization is a classical method to determine uh, DNA fragments specific to a DNA sample, right? So this method is in principle similar to southern hybridization, but in a much higher throughput. Then using a simple but robust statistical method, which is basically based on the hybridization signal ratio between the two DNAs, we finally verified 578 unit genes from the bioinformatical analysis as the final set of orphan genes in cowpea. Those orphan genes in cowpea showed several unique sequence characteristics, such as the shorter length, lower GC content, and a higher percentage of low, complex, low complexity sequences. Interestingly, when predicting the coding potential of these orphan genes, we found that around three-fourths of the orphan genes were predicted to be non-coding. This is interesting because non-coding would usually uh, means regulatory, right? And I will refer to this later, shortly. So in terms of expression, often genes are generally expressed at a low or very low level. In all tissues we exam examined, including leaf, root, flower, and seeds, the often genes express much lower than often uh, than non often genes. However, those often genes they show distinct regulatory patterns under drought stresses. As shown in these figures, we could find a high rate, a high rate of often genes, which is more than 20% with drought response in roots only. And the vast majority of these drought responsive genes are, were upregulated. In contrast, only 3.8% of the orphan genes were differentially expressed in leaves. These are really interesting findings because we all know plant drought response involves first root sensing of the water deficit, then these signals are transferred to the uh, above, above ground part, right? So we assume that the possible, the possible roles of the orphan genes are many drought sensing and signal, uh, and signal transduction and signal regulation. This looks agrees with the non-coding nature of the majority of the OGs of the orphan genes because, as I just said, non-coding means regulatory. To acquire more knowledge about the possible involvement of orphan genes in the uh, drought responses, we performed gene co-expression module network analysis for all differentially expressed genes between normal and drought conditions, orphan genes and non-orphan genes together. We found that 85 orphan genes were class classified into three significant co-expression modules. And the GO tens, the GO tens enriched in these modules includes the pathways related to abiotic stress responses, such as response to stimuli. For example, shown here, this is a cowpea orphan gene, and this is a knowing gene encoding a peroxidized precursor. So this co-expression means this previously unknowing cowpea orphan gene might be involved. Oh, sorry, might be involved 
in the signal pathway of this gene. Then we uh, studied the roles of orphan genes in copy in a more direct way. We use the transgenic approaches because stable transformation of cowpea is still quite difficult. And the gene, and then most of the orphan genes were regulated in roots. So we detoured this difficulty by using a hairy root transformation technology. So in this system, the transgenic plants are actually composite plants, which means their roots are transgenic, while their leaves, their, their uh, shoots, remains wild type. We selected one gene, UP1287-40, which shows the largest fold change in response to root, uh, in response to drought stress in roots, and placed the gene under the control of the cauliflower 35S promoter. We obtained a series of transgenic lines. When treated, the transgenic plants and the wild type plants with PEGs to uh, induce osmotic stresses, we found that the transgenic lines, the transgenic lines, were generally more vigorous than the wild type. And more importantly, we found the phenotype were related to the expression level of the transgenes. In port trials, we could more clearly see the effect of the overexpression of the transgen. Shown here are the transgenic lines, wild types, CKs. We found better performance and the survival rate of the UP1287-40 OE lines than the CK lines on the progressive soil job. So this data taken together suggests that some orphan genes, at least some orphan genes, are really involved in drought adaptations in cowpea. So another part of this research focuses on population genomics of orphan genes. For this purpose, we first we at the first need to call SNPs to catch polymorphisms in orphan genes, right? So we devised a method combining capture sequencing and CASP genotyping for cost, uh, for cost saving and efficient genotyping. We at first selected eight genotypes of cowpea from our John Pleasant collection. As you can see here from the principal component distribution pattern, those eight genotypes were quite, quite dispersely uh, distributed, which means there are far related. So these eight genotypes actually served as the SNP discovery panel in this analysis. We designed a sure select, an engineered sure select target enrichment capture assay, which represents, represented 572 of the orphan genes. We hybridized, we hybridized the capture assay with the DNA of the eight selected genotypes in liquid phase. And after hybridization and washing, we sequenced the captured DNAs, which actually uh, was supposed to be enriched with the target region of the orphan genes. We got a rate of on target reads of around 45 for each library, quite uniform, quite uniform and then average on target sequencing coverage, coverage after sequencing is around 7.5 times. By aligning the DNA sequence, sequence DNA library to the EST, uh, as, to, to the EST derived uni genes as the reference sequence set, we caught 15, 60 SNPs from the transcribed regions in 390 of the 572 orphan genes. Before we take further, taking further actions, we randomly selected 20 orphan genes, which contain 78 putative SNPs for a 
PCR amplification and the Sanger sequencing just for validation. And it turned out 77 of the 78 SNPs that were discovered by capture sequencing were proved by a traditional Sanger sequencing. So these results demonstrated a high accuracy of SNP discovery with this method. Then we are confidently to select one SNP from each orphan gene to transfer them, to convert them to CASP markers. Technically, 379 were ultimately succeeded. Using this set of CASP markers, we geotyped the 223 accessions. And the technical successful rate for CASP assay was 93.4. I want to mention here, so this rate of technical success uh, looks a bit lower than normal than typical CASP assay, and that was because the orphan genes, they sometimes uh, exhibit some sequence characteristics like repeat regions, low complexity regions, so it is normal that the technical successful rate was a little bit lower than the usual. This is the PCA demonstration of the 223 accessions we genotyped. As we can see here, these genotypes can be divided into two subpopulations. This subpopulation, there are many corresponding to the grain type of cowpea, which was considered to be domesticated from the dry land regions grain cowpea, and the, this region, the genotypes are largely, they are largely uh, vegetable cowpeas with longer and tender pods. So those genotypes are considered to be from the humid land, uh, from the humid land domesticated ancestors. Then using the SNP genotypic data of the orphan genes, and the SNP genotypic data of the non orphan genes. So this was previously public, published jointly by the UC Riverside and our group by using the COWP60K SNP array. So we calculated some population genomic parameters independently for the orphan genes and the non orphan genes. Then we compared the results. We found that in general, there are higher heterozygosity higher level of polymorphism information content and a higher level of nuclear diversity in orphan genes than in non-orphan genes. Which is really, really impressive is that we found three times greater Hajimas D value in orphan genes in not, than in non-orphan genes. When we subdividing the plant materials into the subpopulation one and the subpopulation two, we found surprisingly the Taj D value were in different option, uh, directions, which means for the subpopulation one, the Taj D value was positive, but for the another group, it was negative. More often genes showed empirically large positive Taj D value, which means balancing selection in the subpopulation one and more often genes appear to be under no or purifying selection in the subpopulation too, according to their target mass values of being close to zero or negative. The UP1287-40 uh, gene, which was tested in transgenic analysis, showed a considerable target mass D value in subpopulation one only. Then we ask what the implications are for domestication of cowpea from these results. We assume that the more dominant balancing selection, as we noticed in the grain type of cowpea sub subpopulation, would be beneficial for plant adaptation. Uh, sorry. The balancing selection would be consistent with the hypothesized importance of orphan genes in drought adaptation in grain cowpea because 
balancing selection has long known to be beneficial for plant adaptation by maintaining genetic diversity. However, in the vegetable cowpea, the higher level of purifying selection might be a reflection of artificial selection toward balancing the adaptive and agronomical traits. In the less drought prone regions where the vegetable cowpea was domesticated, we assume that some mutations in orphan genes, even though they would be beneficial for drought tolerance, may, on the other hand, harm the quality of agronomical traits, specifically for vegetable use. So they might have been removed during domestication. All right, so the take home message is we identified expressed orphan genes from the cowpea transcriptome, which accounted for around 2% of the total number of unit, unit genes. Orphan genes may exert functions through job sensing and signaling in the roots, as well as participating in conserved stress responsive pathways. Orphan genes, as exampled by the drought upregulated UP12, AT, uh, UP12 something gene, I forgot the name, are really a valuable resource for identifying new genes related to environmental adaptations. Our results also foster a new insight that artificial selection on orphan genes might have contributed to balancing the adaptive and economical traits in domestic crops in various eco-climatic conditions. Finally, I wish to thank all the people I work with. There are the lab members. I've introduced them previously. Jello, our bioinformatician, also at the ZES. Maria, my long-term collaborator at the UC Riverside. Ye Tao, bioinformatics at the BioZero Biotechnology Company. And the, uh, this orphan gene research was funded by the National Science Foundation of China and also the national program for the support of top-notch young professionals. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Pisu, for very nice presentation. And I'm sure that there will be some questions or some clarification from the group. Who would like to initiate? Maybe I can, okay, yeah. Oh, good. So maybe you please first, yeah. With respect to a subpopulation, Um, this is a good question. So for the subpopulation one, which is uh, mainly compo uh, composed of a uh, grain type of coffee, they are more likely to be uh, uh, indeterminate. But for the vegetable type, they are more, uh, oh, sorry, I, 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 sorry. So the, the first group, the first group, they are more uh, determinate, but the vegetable type, they are more indeterminate. Yeah, because they, they have a strong climbing habit. Nice presentation. Uh, there is any discrimination between the, in the characteristic feature of uh, orphan genes and the non-orphan genes mm. you identified? Um, so, did you mean? Did you what, mean? What are the characteristic differences between those ah, orphan genes yes, and non-orphan yes, genes? Right. Yeah, there is a slide showing some uh, unique uh, characteristics of the orphan genes. They are in general shorter in sequence. They, are, uh, they have lower GC content and more repeat, low complexity sequences like A, 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 T, 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 T. So the, why they, are, they have such a unique sequences, we don't know yet, but, but we, we guess they are related to the regulatory functions of these genes. Question. When uh, you're overexpressing the particular like one orphan gene, mm -hmm. Uh, when you are doing the focusing the co-expression studies, is there any particular uh, target for that uh, that orphan gene for the particular orphan gene? You mean the target gene of that orphan gene? Yeah, yeah we haven't uh, we haven't done that, but it's a really interesting future work because we guess this gene uh, should should target should tar should be targeting to some functional genes to exert the function as a regulator. So this might be uh, accomplished by uh, doing like a degrading sequencing or uh, similar technologies. Yeah, we, 
we will be doing that. Thank you. Manish, please, sir. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Did you try to see these orphan genes in the, because they are specific to that particular crop, like you, in your case, cowpea? So, did you try to check with the wilds of the cowpea if they come from the wilds specific to that particular species, not others? So, uh, pardon me. So, what is the main point of the question? I didn't get. So, his question is that you have done the EST analysis ah, yeah. from the domesticated cowpea, ah. whether these genes they were present in the wild species of cowpea, ah. so before the domestication? Uh, I have no uh, definite answer because those unigenes were uh, derived from the uh, seeding and library sequencing of, uh, uh, I think, many uh, commercial cultivars in Africa and also in the United States. But that is a really interesting question because often genes seem to be evolved more rapidly, rapidly than normal genes. So yeah, so that might be an interesting question to uh, you know to a future task to see if if the in the short term short process of domestication if there are some orphan genes can arise. Really interesting. Yeah. Lekha. Has what? Sorry. Tissue. Ah, tissue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Most of the orphan genes show. Uh, uh, very obvious uh, tissue uh, uh, preference. Some are only pressed in seeds, some only in flowers. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Gore. I just wonder, you know, why can't we just call the gene as a crop specific genes? Why do we have to call them orphan genes? Ah. <laughs> you know, yeah. These are basically crop specific. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is our ignorance that they are not there. Otherwise. Yeah, you are not the only person asked this question. So I think we can understand from this uh, sense because they they are present in only a single species or yeah. a, a particular species. So they are like they feel alone. They are like orphans. So <laughs> that's my understanding. So any gene when it is involved, you know, one time it is in one particular, then it you know further evolves. Mm. So this this is a just evolution like mm. that. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Why do we have to call them orphan? Yeah, yeah. Actually, we don't have to call them yeah. orphan genes, but it's quite a, a historical line because before the the you know the birth of the genome genome work genome, so the number of orphan genes people find is very limited, and at that time people didn't expect to see so many orphan genes. So. So this is basically yeah, species this, specific gene is better, but then this came from this human yeah, genome yeah. nature paper. Yes. Where they analyzed with chicken, dog, and other mm. thing, and then they gave this terminology. People keep on following the right, right terminology. Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Well, there are many questions, so let's go one by one. Rakesh, so your your presentation was really good. Otherwise, generally we don't have so many questions. <laughs> Rakesh, please. Yeah. Um, so, pardon me because I didn't quite get your point. So, my, my question mm. is very simple. In cowpea, mm. uh, how many set of orphan genes mm. you find linked ah. to giving especially uh, high drought tolerance? Ah, so uh, only one gene currently was verified by transgenic uh, experiments, but like uh, 85 genes were found to be involved in a co-expression network with knowing drug responsive genes and many more orphan genes were found to be under uh, transcriptional regulation uh, under drought conditions. So, so evidence is uh, actually at different levels. Some are more solid, some are like a still superficial, but we quite believe that, that at least some of the orphan genes are indeed related to drought resistance in cowpea. Excuse me? Ah, vertical gene transfer. Uh, yeah, we didn't do that, but but that could be a, another interesting issue. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Good. Uh, Paramita, then SK. Yeah. Great presentation, indeed. Uh, I just wanted to know, as you have stated, that you started your study with EST-derived unigenes, right? 
and when now we have the genome sequence mm. have you realigned them and found some new insights for this orphan genes yeah uh, we haven't made a made a very detailed comparisons between the results from genome comparison and the EST approach but uh, what is obvious is these approaches have missed some uh, orphan genes definitely because the EST libraries they are just from uh, constructed from several particular uh, circumstances but there are also there should be also some uh, uh, false positives in the genome comparison because the annotation of the copy genome is not so I would say it's not very very good and some genes are like shooter genes or uh, like uh, from uh, annotation artifact artifacts and many of the genes often genes that are identified from genome comparison might not actually be functional or even expressed yeah. but the unigen uh, approach they identify all functional genes I think good SK please yeah, you mentioned that uh, cowpea has a higher tolerance than sorghum <laughs> and pearl millet. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, he's pearl millet breeder. Ah, pearl millet breeder, right? Yeah. So, uh, so he is opposing me, right? <laughs> well, let's see whether he opposes or he accepts. Let's see first, yeah. When well, drought tolerance is a very broad terminology you have used. So here I like to know uh, means drought tolerance can be evaluated at seedling stage also, flowering stage also, ah. post flowering also. So when you uh, give this statement two questions means what stage you are talking mm -hmm. uh, and what you had measured exactly uh, which trade you had measured to say this that cowpea has higher drought tolerance than these two crops yeah so uh, that that's what that sentence is was a uh, from a publication many years ago I I think that study was performed at the seedling stage by comparing the water leaf water potential uh, between the different species so the conclusion was drawn because the researchers they uh, observed uh, we observed uh, uh, is it higher or lower I think it uh, should be a, a higher a higher water leaf water potential always than the other two so the conclusion would be a uh, cowpea is, uh, is a more efficient drought avoider than the per millet and the sorghum so yeah you are pr probably right you know, I I need to be more carefully considered my wording might be uh, right well but I mean that's fine but he mentioned professor BV Singh's paper and someone else and you know that dr. BV Singh has been cowpea breeder maybe you set up another experiment maybe results will come that pulmonate is more drought tolerant than cowpea <laughs> so so this varies sometimes people are biased but what you did not do anything wrong you mentioned that mm. statement mm. from that paper right 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 the, you essentially may not agree or because you have not set up the text yeah 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 I, I yeah I like it just to con so you just them, made the conclusions from that and also. you are also making this statement mm. because you are working on coffee mm. right right yeah <laughs> so <laughs> okay so Pesu as you, I told that many people they were listening your presentation online mm. so here some people have asked the question as well we will take only one question now and then because we will go for the next session so can you speak mm. Okay. Thanks, Who is sir. sitting in the campus but did not come for the presentation? I'm sorry, but no problem. No, you don't need to Thanks. be sorry. No need to be sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, doctor, for the excellent presentation. Request for opinion. The role of orphan gene is evaluation to domestication for crop varieties, example maize, tropical to temperate. This is not a question. Opinion. So he is asking the opinion mm -hmm. that he works on the sorghum. Sorghum mm -hmm. is closely related to maize. So in the case of maize, what is it? Tropical maize to temperate maize? Yeah. So what is his question? This is, he wants just a opinion, sir. The role of orphan genes evolution to domestication for crop uh, varieties. Yeah. Example, so he is saying that what do you think about the role of orphan genes mm -hmm. for the domestication in the crops like maize? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think uh, for the domestic of maize, because I don't really know much about maize. I don't know whether the maize, uh, unlike cowpeas, to have uh, like a quite uh, domestication from quite different eco climates. And uh, if not, if not, I guess 
I just guess. I guess the selection of orphan genes might not be a uh, might not be necessarily include the balancing between uh, adaptation and uh, uh, and agronomical traits. But if maize similar to cowpea, they have different types. So they can do that. Orphan genes might might differentially be uh, selected. Okay. Maybe last question. Yeah. So this question is coming from the guy working on the World West Center. Uh, World Taiwan? Vegetable Research Center. Taiwan? Not Taiwan. He is sitting here in Hyderabad itself. Oh, okay. Just 500 meter or maybe 200 meter from this <laughs> this seminar hall. <laughs> His name is Bindu. Huh? Bindu, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the interesting talk. Is orphan gene expression pattern alter between grain copy and veg copy? Are they stage specific and environment controlled? Thanks. He has asked many questions. You can answer only one. Okay. So what do you see the variation mm. of expression of orphan genes no. between grain cowpea versus no. vegetable cowpea? Ah, so the expression differences between the different subpopulations, right? That's the question. Yeah, we didn't do that yet, but uh, I guess that could be possible because the different types of cowpea adaptive to uh, contrasting environments uh, may we do not need the same level of expressions of some orphan genes if these genes are really, really specifically related to job adaptation. But we need to do experiments too. Yeah. Very good. I think that we had very, very good presentation and we had a lot of discussions. And you can guess if you, when we go to or I go to China, many times people don't ask questions because they are very respectful, which is not the case here in India. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this means that they are also very interested to listen your presentation you. and to have the discussions with you. So with these words, please join me in thanking Pishu for wonderful presentation. And also thanks for the leaders from the Zhejiang Academy of Agriculture Sciences. So thank you very much for them. And thanks to all of you for participating in this discussion here as well as online. The people who are sitting here, they are most welcome invited to join cup of tea and coffee. The people who are online, they can have coffee in their own office. <laughs> and have a nice day. So let's break for the tea and coffee. Thank you very much to those colleagues also who were joining online. Thanks.